Viewer discretion is advised for this educational documentary. Welcome or welcome back to Dark Case Documentaries. I bring you true crime, disturbing stories and other things you may later regret knowing with regular uploads every week. Please do join our quickly growing, incredibly supportive Dark Case family by hitting subscribe now and turning on notifications. Thank you so much to all of my patrons. If your name is on screen right now, then you're a legend. Our love and respect goes out to all those that knew and loved Yara and all those affected by this dark case. Brembate de Sopra is a small and picturesque town. It is four miles northwest of the city of Bergamo in northern Italy. With just 8,000 residents, it is a humble town, with homes still using wood-burning stoves, raising chickens, and growing their own vegetables. Among this rural community lived the Gambarazio family. Fulvio, an architect, and his wife Mara, a teacher, had lived there all of their lives. Their families had been in the area for generations. Fulvio and Mara had four children. The eldest was daughter Kiba, aged 15, Yara, who was 13, and then two younger sons, Naiten and Jia Lee. Yara was passionate about gymnastics, she enjoyed school, and she loved being with her siblings. Now a teenage girl, she was known for her dark curly hair. She always wore it free and wild, unless that is, she was at gymnastics. At gymnastics, Yara was a different person. She was poised, composed and measured. This was far from the happy, carefree soul that she was day to day. But she loved her sport and she had hopes and dreams of being the very best. At 13 years old, she had all of the time in the world to make those dreams a reality. On Friday the 26th of November 2010, it was just another Friday in the small town. Yara was gearing up for a gymnastics competition that weekend. She'd been practicing her routine almost endlessly. To do this, she had borrowed her instructor, Sylvia's stereo, to use at home. She knew that she needed to return it before the weekend. And at 5.15pm on Friday, she left her home for the sports centre to go and meet Sylvia. At this time, the weather was cold and there was snow in the air. The sports centre was just 700 metres from Yara's house. This was a route that Yara had walked alone hundreds of times. It took only 10 minutes at the very maximum. The sports centre was a large building, very much like a school. It had a big gate, multiple entrances, tennis courts, a running track and a swimming pool. Once there, Yara returned the stereo to Sylvia and then caught up with a few of her friends before doing a training session. It was the big competition that weekend after all. An extra half an hour of practice could make all the difference. She finished up and left the sports centre building at around 6.45pm. Shortly after, she sent a text message to her friend Martina, arranging to meet on Sunday at 8am. Mother Mara didn't expect her to be gone for very long, so waiting at home, she kept a close eye on the clock. By 7pm, she had grown worried. The need to get Yara home safe and warm was made more immediate. The snow outside was getting heavier, the conditions growing more extreme by the minute. And besides the weather, Yara definitely should have been home by now. At 7.11pm, the mother phoned Yara's phone. However, the call went straight to voicemail. After checking the sports centre to no avail, 20 minutes later, Yara's father made the decision to call the police. The call was put through to the public prosecutor's office in Bergamo. There, the prosecutor on duty was Letitia Rigeri. She was a tough former policewoman who had earned respect within the force. She worked against the Sicilian Mafia in Sicily in southern Italy. She also didn't waste any time and within five minutes of receiving the call, she had dispatched both state police officers and the Carabinieri military police to the village. The family was understandably already fraught with worry. 
People came out of their houses to help search for Yara. The fire department walked the banks of the river. Police and volunteers searched the nearby fields, abandoned buildings, and asked passers-by if they'd seen any sign of Yara. The sports centre too was searched inside and out. Dogs were used to track the path where Yara had walked. However, these dogs didn't follow the path back to Yara's home. Instead, they trailed off towards Mapello. This was a small hamlet three kilometres in the opposite direction. By this time, the team had been able to analyse the last signals from Yara's mobile phone. Her phone had shown a signal in Mapello at 6.49pm, back on the evening of her disappearance. This was five minutes after Yara had sent a text message to her friend Martina. This means Yara, or at least her phone, must have travelled by car to where it was last pinged in Mapello. Yara obviously couldn't drive, so who was she with? Had she simply taken a taxi ride? Had she maybe run away with a friend? Or, the most sinister option, had Yara been kidnapped, taken against her will? Surveillance video footage was released. It showed a vehicle driving past the sports centre. It was a small white utility vehicle with an open back. We call them flatbeds in the UK. This vehicle was captured driving past around the time of Yara's disappearance. The same vehicle was also shown to pass several more times on other days leading up to Yara going missing. Frustratingly, no registration plate was able to be identified on the footage. So instead, police released images of the vehicle itself, all in the hope that either the owner would come forward, or someone else who recognised the vehicle would come forward instead. However, no one did, and the case went cold over Christmas. This investigation was at a dead end. On the 25th of February 2011, three months after Yara went missing, investigators finally had a breakthrough. A local man had recently bought a remote-controlled aeroplane. He was still learning how to fly it, so he found an open field in a small town around six miles from where Yara was last seen. This was somewhere where the man felt he could fly his plane freely. This area is surrounded by industrial estates, spare lots and fields. As he flew the remote-controlled aircraft, he discovered that it wasn't quite working properly so he landed it amongst some tall grass. As he walked over to pick it up, he saw what he thought were some rags and rubbish on the ground. However, as he got closer, he was met with a harrowing sight. He saw shoes, girls' shoes, and a body. It was frozen and partly degraded. This was sadly the body of Yara Gambirazio. Now I know what you're probably thinking, how did it take three months to find Yara's body? She was found just 10 kilometres from her home, and this field had already been searched in the days after Yara's disappearance, so things didn't quite add up. The police speculated that the killer dumped her body after watching them search the area. Still nearby to the body, they found Yara's iPod and house keys. They found the SIM card and battery for her LG phone, but the phone itself was missing. The autopsy found she had suffered a head injury, possibly inflicted with a rock and several blows to the body. She had also been jabbed at with a sharp implement numerous times, but it was determined that she didn't actually pass from these lacerations, nor from the loss of vital fluids. Yara had instead died from exposure to cold weather after she lost consciousness. There were also traces of lime in Yara's respiratory tract, and the presence of a vegetable fibre used to make rope on Yara's clothing. The killer may have worked in the building trade, and this wasn't all the killer left behind. Male DNA was found in Yara's underwear. I know what you're probably imagining this DNA sample was. However, from the available information, it was in fact the male's blood. This led police to the theory that it was likely that the attacker had attempted to violate Yara. However, the strong gymnast put up a good fight, or possibly his intentions were interrupted in some other way. Regardless, the police had something solid to go on. The killer was given a nickname, 
unknown one. They now had their man, but they still had to find him. The search for Unknown One included a secret team of eight special agents. They asked for volunteers to submit DNA samples to help catch Yara's killer. Classmates, families of classmates, friends and members of the community all came forward. A staggering 22,000 people from the area volunteered their DNA. DNA matching was slow work. It took different geneticists in Parma, Pavia and Rome a minimum of six hours to transform just a few samples of DNA into something which could be read and compared. The cost of materials and manpower made this investigation one of the most expensive manhunts in Italian history. Investigators eventually made a breakthrough. They found one person who volunteered their DNA closely resembled the prime suspect, Unknown One. He was a 20-year-old man named Damiano Corioni. Damiano was quickly excluded as a suspect. He had been in South America when Yara disappeared, and his DNA wasn't an exact match. However, it was clear that he was a close-blood relative of Unknown One. Rigeri and her team were ecstatic, feeling that it would only be a matter of days before they would have the murderer behind bars. The team tracked down Damiano's family and found out that his mother, Aurora, had worked for Yara's family for 10 years as a housemaid. Aurora lived nearby and had been at Yara's house twice a week since she was a baby. In fact, Aurora and Yara were very close, and Yara always asked her for advice on her gymnastics routines. Aurora, who was very protective of Yara, was forever telling her to be careful. When investigators questioned her, she said it was the worst thing that had ever happened to her. She said she was completely distraught, but she also said that she wasn't responsible. Aurora was subsequently cleared and the team turned their focuses to Damiano's father. He had a brother, Giuseppe Quariano, who had died in 1999. The team contacted his widow, Laura. He found an envelope with a stamp on it in a box of documents that had belonged to her husband. Giuseppe had been the one to lick this stamp, which left his DNA behind. They were able to confirm it was Giuseppe who had licked the stamps, and his DNA sequence was an even closer match to Unknown One than Damiano's was. Giuseppe was the father of Unknown One. The team started to build a picture of Giuseppe and his family. Giuseppe and Laura had three children, a daughter and two sons. DNA checks showed that neither son was unknown one, so that left only one possibility. Somewhere out there was the illegitimate son of Giuseppe. Police were near to making a complete U-turn in their investigation. Instead of searching for a man, they were searching for a woman. The killer's mother, a woman possibly in her 60s, who had an affair with Giuseppe decades earlier. She then got pregnant and went on to have Giuseppe's son, who then went on to kill Yara. There were 532 women listed as possibly being the mother of Unknown One. The team began the task of tracking down each one of these women. As police conducted their own hunts for the mother of Unknown One, the villages surrounding Bergamo were searched. Conversations and whispers led police from one house to the next. One by one, they spoke to each woman on their list of over 500. By this stage, it was June of 2014. This was three and a half years since Yara had first disappeared. The chance of this killer still being in the hilltop villages of Lombardy seemed unlikely. However, police were persistent, and one day they finally got a name. It was finally given reluctantly in a whisper. Esther Azul. In the late 1960s, Esther had been Giuseppe's neighbour. She married a man named Giovanni Bassetti from a nearby village. Esther and Giovanni lived in Brembate di Sopra, the small village Yara had lived in and disappeared from. Esther denied ever having an affair with Giuseppe, but the police knew that her sons were born in the right period of time, meaning that she was probably lying. One son was quickly ruled out, but the other, Massimo Passetti, was a 42-year-old married father of three. 
and he lived in Mapello, the very place where the last signal from Yara's phone had pinged. He was a bricklayer nicknamed the animal by his friends. When he was younger, he was known to love partying. He was short and thin with piercing blue eyes and a peroxide pencil goatee. Within a few days, the investigators decided the best approach would be to set up a roadblock near his house for random breath testing. This way, they could collect his DNA without him suspecting anything. Massimo was driving home with his wife and three children when he was stopped by police. The officer knew exactly what he was doing. He pretended the first breath test didn't work and so he performed a second one. The officers now had two sets of Massimo's DNA and Massimo had no idea this seemingly innocent random breath test was actually a test to confirm if he had murdered Yara. The following day on the 16th of June 2014, Ruggeri received the call she had been waiting for. Massimo Pacetti was unknown one. On the 16th of June 2014, the very same day, Massimo was arrested whilst working on a local construction site. He had no prior criminal record, he denied any involvement in the crime, and he said that he was altogether innocent. The last piece of the puzzle fell into place when the investigators matched Massimo's vehicle to the small white utility vehicle that had been spotted on CCTV all those years earlier. Massimo argued that he just happened to drive by the sports centre on his way home from work that day. However, police were able to confirm that he didn't work that day at all. Investigators used telephone records, surveillance video, along with testimony from colleagues to prove he was lying. They finally had their man. The trial commenced on Friday the 3rd of June 2015. Massimo had not moved from his claims of innocence. People were surprised that, facing such clear DNA evidence against him, he still claimed that he was not the guilty party. His wife testified he was home having dinner with her and their kids at the time of the murder. The trial would include 60,000 pages of records of inquiries and 120 witnesses were called to testify for the prosecution. Massimo's defence said that they had 711 witnesses as well as about 50 experts and consultants. However, the court made them cut this down to a total of 160 people. Sylvia Brenner, who was Yara's gym instructor that lent her the stereo, faced scrutiny at the trial when she became a focus of Massimo's defence team. On the night of Yara's disappearance, Sylvia's father confirmed that Sylvia had cried all night with no explanation. She also could not explain why she and her brother had sent text messages to each other at the time of Yara's disappearance, messages which they almost immediately deleted but strangely they hadn't deleted any other of their messages. A bombshell was then dropped in the courtroom, something that had never come out before the trial. This was the very reason why Sylvia became the defence team's hot ticket. The forensics lab noticed what they called dark halos, indicating the presence of blood on the sleeve cuffs of Yara's jacket and when testing the stain they discovered the DNA belonged to Sylvia. It was confirmed that there was no way for this DNA to have been left as contact DNA, and after three months in the element, it had to have been a significant fluid such as blood. Sylvia was criticised for answering I don't know to at least 10 questions on the witness stand. This included how her DNA got onto Yara's sleeve cuff. Ruggeri and her team examined Massimo's computer after his arrest, and what they found painted a harrowing picture of a man who was interested in young girls. Massimo also regularly hung out around Yara's home, as well as a sports centre where Yara trained. He was seen on security footage circling the gym on different days. He would park nearby on some occasions. His phone was also found to have been in the area many times in the lead up to Yara's disappearance. It was even nearby on the afternoon that she disappeared. Massimo had switched his phone off at 5.45pm the day that Yara vanished, and he did not switch it back on until 7.30am the following morning. 
A local woman testified that at around 7pm on the day Yara disappeared, she was taking out the garbage at her home. Whilst outside, she saw a vehicle matching Massimo's pass by at high speed. She said she saw a young person inside, but she was unsure if it was a boy or a girl. She said she heard screaming coming from the vehicle and it was cut off mid-scream. She went to the police and gave them this information as soon as she heard of Yara's disappearance. On the 1st of July 2016, Massimo Bassetti was found guilty. He was sentenced to life in prison for the murder of Yara. Although Sylvia's DNA being found on Yara's cuff was an explosive development, and something the defence relied upon heavily, Sylvia was never a suspect. She was investigated thoroughly and subsequently cleared. Massimo has tried to appeal his conviction multiple times since 2016, but each of them has been thrown out. Yara's killer will never see freedom again. Do you think the punishment fits the crime here? What do you think can be done to avoid something like this happening again in the future? Please do let me know down in the comments. If you appreciate what I'm doing here, please do hit that like button. Be careful out there and I'll see you soon.